convocation today, we are so pleased to have Lily Havey with us today to talk about identity, uh, as she explains in, in her book, Gasa Gasa Girl Goes to Camp. Um, one thing uh, I need you to know about this particular presentation today, it is in uh, conjunction with the Holocaust exhibit that is uh, in our library right now that will be there through October 11th. If you have not had a chance to go visit the library and the Holocaust exhibit there, you should definitely take some time to do so. Now please allow me to introduce uh, Lily. Lily was born in Los Angeles because of Executive Order 9066 signed by President Roosevelt at the outbreak of World War II. Lily was sent to the Santa Anita Holding Center and the Amachi internment camp in Colorado during the war for almost four years. When the war ended, the family then moved to Salt Lake City. After high school, Lily pursued a music degree at the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston, majoring in piano. She taught English, humanities, and creative writing and sponsored the literary magazine in high school for 14 years before she opened and operated a stained glass studio and business for 30 years. In the early 80s, she heard stories of veterans returning from the Vietnam War with PTSD, and doctors and counselors were using art, such as music and paintings, as therapies. She wondered whether her free-floating anxiety was due to her experiences in the concentration camps during World War II. She realized quickly that she could not easily express her emotional responses in glass and began watercoloring. Most of these paintings are included in her book, Gasa Gasa Girl Goes to Camp, a Nisei Youth Behind a World War II Fence. The book is about her four years at the camps, told from the viewpoint of a preteen maturing into puberty. She enjoys watercolor and continues to paint scenes of Japan and Southern Utah. Please welcome Lily Havey. Thank you. As uh, she said, my book is about the four years that I spent in a concentration camp in um, Amachi and Santa Anita during World War II. And I painted the art first, which is kind of interesting. And when I would put um, the when they would be displayed in libraries and museums, I was asked for a little blurb, and I said, okay, well, that's real easy, but it wasn't, because each painting and each blurb had a story, and that I started writing, and so those stories are what became Gasa Gasa Girl. And I also get asked, quite a bit, what does gasa gasa mean? And in Hiroshima dialect, it means someone who can't sit still. I suppose if I were in elementary school today, the teacher would say, oh, you, you need a bottle of ri ri Ritalin to calm you down and um, send me to the nurse's office. But I could not sit still. Like, you know, you students here are sitting quietly and it was really hard for me to do that. It's still, it's still hard. In um, movies, for instance, two, two hours in a, just sitting there, you know. <laughs> Some of you agree, yeah, okay. And you know how that goes. Um, but Gasa Gasa um, in reality is the sound, it's an onomatopoeia the sound of autumn leaves that are falling down. And so today in Japan, they would say, ah, and they would, they would watch these leaves fall and say, ah, gasa gasa. And so that's, that's the meaning of that. Um, I brought some art that I did for the, my son, my son Michael and I did for the Beehive Show and it's called identity. I don't want to take time right now to explain it, but, but afterwards, if you want to come up, then um, I will tell you about it. Also, there are books for sale. I 
Cheryl was going to tell you about that. And Anne at the um, King's English was kind enough to say, oh, yeah, these are students, so let's give them 20% discount. So it's like $30. Pretty, pretty, still a lot. All right. I am going to use my book as um, exploring identity. And this is, seems to be a real interesting current topic right now. My mother and father came from Japan and they were immigrants. <laughs> And they were immigrants and really struggled. They came in 1922, 1923, because there was an ex Asian exclusion law that the United States passed in 1924 where anyone from Asia could not come to the United States. This is kind of equivalent to our haggling over, you know, the the fence, the, the border fence right now, and what's happening with the immigration question uh, today. But World War II came along, and Pearl Harbor happened, and there's a Japanese version of Pearl Harbor, and there's an American version of Pearl Harbor. And I, again, don't want to get into the complications of the um, reasons why Pearl Harbor happened. And some say that it was a sneak attack, but apparently Roosevelt had some communication that this was somehow going to happen. And um, he was at the end of, of um, a recession and thought maybe that a war would be a good thing, that it would unite the United States, and it certainly did that during World War II. All right. Um, this happened on February 19th, 1942, uh, and President Roosevelt signed an executive order on, on, Febu on February 19, on, I'm sorry, February 19, 1942. That's when he signed the proclamation. At the, and there's a, a replica of it here. And it gives what we could do, what we couldn't do. And like, we could only take one suitcase, no pets, et cetera, et cetera. And you, you're welcome to, to uh, read that. Um, I, and every year in the Japanese and Japanese American community, there's something called a Day of Remembrance on February 19th, and it's probably something new to you, but it's a very important date for, for people like me. Okay, I was sent to Santa Anita, race track for um, half a year. And the reason for that was there were, there were no, they, they, wanted, uh, they wanted 120,000 people evacuated from the west coast. If you lived within 60 miles of the coast, the police, the army, the soldiers could come and just say, hey, time to go, and they would go. And it's also interesting that a few days after Pearl Harbor, men, men of what they call of importance to the Japanese community started disappearing, and families didn't know where they, where they were, where they, for maybe half a year, they didn't know where they went to. And so, the United States government actually had been keeping track of important Japanese and Japanese-American people before Pearl Harbor. 
and I know a few families that were the males, like preachers and teachers, particularly teachers of Japanese, just disappeared. Okay, and so I was sent to Santa Anita, and they built these barracks very hastily um, on tracts of land where um, there, was, there was this big expanse. They didn't know what to do with 120,000 people. And so they used fairgrounds, racetracks, um, places like that to, to hastily build barracks. And Santa Anita Racetrack was one of the biggest in uh, the, the Pacific Coast. People who were sent there early, before the barracks were built, actually had to live in the horse stables, and they didn't, they didn't clean out the horse stables. And so the people who went there were actually mucking out horse manure before they could live there, before they could sleep. And there are pictures that you could access, I think probably on the internet, showing people doing this and um, trying to live in conditions like this. By the time we got there, they had barracks. And I will read you a little portion of that. This next picture, oh, I forgot about this. This is my mother. And she ha apparently had a huge identity problem because when she first came, her husband, my father, told her, get rid of all the kimonos that you brought because once you're on American soil, you're an American. And I don't know what they did with the uh, kimonos, whether they burned them or um, just left them or tossed them. She, they didn't talk about it. I just knew that they, he said that and she got rid of them. But here she is, looking like a flapper with uh, heels and bobbed hair. And the only time that I saw my mother in a kimono was when she did a tea ceremony that she was learning in Salt Lake City or in, at the Obon dances. And you know what Obon is, the festival of the dead that they have uh, dancing. In this painting, before the war, I not before we, the evacuation, I was, I dreamed a lot about, this, this is kind of like a nightmare. And there are ghosts in the background up, up, up there at the top and um, weird figures that just came to me and over to your left are soldiers and I, I was always afraid that these soldiers would be that these soldiers would be coming to my door and just forcing us out somewhere that we didn't know where we were going to go. We were also told that the Japanese and Japanese Americans would be sent back to Japan. And I said, well, Japan, you know, I've never been there. My mother and father talked about it, but you know, I had no idea where this was. There's a skeleton at the top. And um, anyway, th this was called Night Story. Oops. This is, oh, before we went to um, Santa Anita, the gathering point was a church. And there's a church up at top, and this picture has been cropped a little bit. There's a gold cross at the top, and you can't see it here, but that cross symbolizes hope uh, that no matter what happens, this, this might still work out. 
But we gathered there, and my mother came back with um, tags that had a number on it. And this is where um, this starts. My mother returns with cardboard tags stamped 18286 and ties one to the front of my dress. She puts another on my father's suitcase. What is this? So many people, it's just simpler to remember numbers, so they gave us this number. That's funny, I'll write my name on it. No, they only want that number. My mother, when she was packing, I asked her what we were gonna do, and she said we're going camping. And camping, to me, was Girl Scout camping, Boy Scout camping, right, where you, where you um, toast marshmallows, where you sing um, songs, where you tell ghost stories and you sleep in tents. And so, at the, even before we were sent to camp, the government then is erasing our identity. They're, 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 not get, take, they're not addressing us by name, and they're just saying, here, you're a number. And so in this painting, I traced my left hand, which is right down here, and that's my, that's my literal left hand with 18286 on it. At the bottom, from a dream, from a dream and I'll read, it, read this to you, is a hand with a surrender flag. It's time to get on the bus, Yuriko. Where's Daddy? He'll be here. Get in line. Please, let's late, wait for Daddy. My mother, my brother appears just as we board the bus, but there's no sign of my father. I don't want to go up first. I don't want people to see my underpants, so I want to go last. But the crowd urges us up the, sense, up the steps. My mother pushes me forward, and I insist on a window seat. Maybe I'll catch a glimpse of my father, but the bus starts without him. Then I must have slept, because out, when the bus stops outside, I see soldiers in front of a barbed wire fence, and behind them are row after row of black uh, shacks, but no tents. Where are the tents? The monument, the mountains, the trees, so many boxes and suitcases and black-haired people. Who are they all? Are they all camping with us? Yuriko, come stand up, my mother nudges. And so she, we go to the barrack and we, um, I protest going in because I don't want this, this dirty old place. And um, I tell my mother I, I want to go home. And she says, no, uh, this, we have to stay here because uh, it's a camp for the Japanese people. And I asked her, what, wh why is that? And she really didn't explain this to me. But um, um, then, then we go out and we have to get our uh, blankets. And so we do that, and when we come back, my father is there. Daddy, Daddy, <laughs> I run to him. We got our blanket. Where did you get yours? But he doesn't answer. My mother turns toward us, ignoring my father. Put your blankets down, get ready for bed. I try hard not to cry. Mama, let's go home. We found daddy, let's go home. I don't want to camp anymore. My mother hands me my pajamas and tells me to change. I stare at my father, curled up on his bed. The morning had begun with such anticipation. He and I were going camping. We were going to have so much fun. Wake up, daddy, wake up. Let's go home, let's go home now. I get into bed, determined not to cry. This painting in front of you is the first that I ever did uh, of the whole series. And it, my whole kind of emotions came through on this. And I painted the um, guard tower 
light coming red. And this is my description of that night. It was a strange night. Searchlights swept our window. Sometimes the light flooded the room, outlining our cots against the slatted walls, and then drained away, leaving ghostly images. Sometimes the light seemed seeped in slowly, probing like a gelatinous creature. Sometimes the streams of light appeared red, resembling blood washing over the walls. Light, dark, light, dark, over and over again. Footsteps passed by, some marching angrily, some shuffling quietly. Voices from all directions disturbed my sleep. They mumbled, they cried, babies wailed. Skeletons lay beneath the barrack. That's in a dream, of course. A bony hand thrust up a white surrender flag. Pine sap oozed from fresh cut lumber and a sharp tang enveloped me. When I awoke, I, I found beads of pitch tangled in my hair. If any of you got pitch from fresh cut lumber in your hair, you know that it does not come out. And my mother used to cut it off just sniffing and my hair would just kind of be sticking up all over. People thought it was really funny. My father did not get up, so we tiptoed out, and um, we got um, a meal and came back and found that my father was gone. Where did he go? But of course my mother didn't know. Neither statement, he, he, probably to eat, he'll come back soon, but neither statement was true. He didn't return until dark almost every day that summer. My father was an elusive shadow. Once I asked him where he went, I don't like it here, repeated, looking at me. I don't like it here. Well, I don't either. I hate it, I said, hoping that my agreement would win a tiny bit of reassurance. Life is no fun. This camp is, his voice trailed off, and he walked away. My mother clipped, better that he's gone. Better that he's gone? What, what did she mean? This is my father. He belonged with us here. And then I felt that he was becoming less a person and more that number, 18286, a stranger. My father's spirit seemed to have vanished. It wasn't just daddy. All of us were gone. Physically, true, we had left our lives in Los Angeles, but this empty feeling emerged from a space deep inside my body. It welled up, spread like a chill, and infested my entire being except there was nothing there, gone. The word was so empty and final, gone. At Santa Anita, one of the very first things that happened was um, they, they made us repeat the Pledge of Allegiance every morning. It was pretty ironic that they, they did this, and this is my prescription of a group of boys that were rebelling. A disembodied male voice crackled through a bullhorn. Attention, students. Miss Nakasuji quickly reminded us, time for the pledge, students. Hands over your hearts. Left hand, no, right hand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. My thoughts, why were we still pledging allegiance to the United States? The government had, had classified as evil Japanese and herded us into this camp. Maybe we ought to be singing the Japanese anthem. Kimi ga yo wa. Yes, I knew that anthem. My mother had taught it to me because she claimed, you're Japanese, Yuriko. Japanese? No, I'm American. And there's this, there's this um, duality again. What, what am I? I insisted, I'm American. But I had learned it anyway because it was so beautiful and such a sad melody. I had an idea, I had no idea of its meaning, but I knew that it was, I knew the words koke and rocks. Koke and ishi. 
rocks and moss. But so it must have something to do with nature. The stadium echoed with a mob of voices and to the Republic for which it stands. Below me, a group of high school boys stood with their hands clasped behind their backs. No one else seemed to notice. I had seen these boys before, loitering at the base of the stadium, cigarettes dangling at their lips, with liberty and justice for all. We sat down. However, the boys continued to stand, and now the students did notice and watched. They snapped their arms in a military salute what are they doing? Show-offs. They're gutsy, a student commented, admiration in his voice. Part of the Blades. Blades? One of the LA gangs. The boys marched away, legs moving in unison. Their teacher did not stop them. I found an impulse to escape with them. Just stand and go. How hard could that be? Just go, move. But I couldn't force my bottom off the bench, and so I just sat, sat there like most of us. We were just sat and we accepted what was there. Okay, but if you are an American, you are, um, let's see, <laughs> you are, um, Native American, which are the, the people that were here 25,000 years ago, or African American, and probably enslaved, or from Africa, probably from Africa, or another um, country. An indentured servant, which were people who signed on uh, a contract to come to the United States to work, and a lot of them came here to work on the railroad, and I was really surprised when I checked that there were one million Japanese who had come as indentured servants. You know, that's a lot. Or you were an immigrant like my parents were, or you were a refugee, and uh, we know a lot about refugees today. But we, um, this, this picture means quite a bit because this, this again came from a dream and I paint quite a few of my mine from dreams. This Japanese woman floated out of a picture frame and she just sort of floated up into the air and just disappeared. And my intention was to paint the barbed wire that you see in white here all the way down to the bottom. But when I got to that certain line here, the barbed wire turned into calligraphy. And I thought, well, that's really strange. You know, it, it was sort of like my hand was not doing what my brain was telling it to do, but my, it, it just sort of happened. And so I went to one of my, my mother's prayer books and I copied, I wish it was a little clearer, but I copied what was there and I have no idea what it says, but this is at the bottom of uh, um, a prayer. In, in Japanese. Where are we here? Oh, let's see, no, no, we're not quite there. Okay. One day, one day uh, in early spring, my father appeared and my father was this home again, out again person, all, kind of all my life he was this way. For one thing, he was a drunkard, he was an alcoholic, and um, unpredictable. And so in camp, they allowed older men 
to go east from Colorado, to go east to find jobs, and he did that and found one in uh, New Jersey. One day in early spring, my father reappeared in Amachi. When I returned from school, there he was, stooping over his gaping suitcase. Daddy, I yelled, you're back. Hello, Yuri-chan, you've grown, and Yuriko is my Japanese name. I thought to myself, why do you sound so distant? Yes, I've grown. I've grown in the half year that you were gone. You only wrote once, telling us you had arrived at Seabrook Farms, and then nothing. Mom wrote you letters, which were returned addressy unknown, and this was really funny, really strange. We worried, don't you care about us? I was about to voice my complaints when I noticed the square package by the suitcase. My father squatted carefully and untied it, revealing a gleaming hot plate. Here, I brought you and Mama something. He waited for a reply, but I was speechless. I mean, these are pretty precious things. We cook our old meals at Seabrook, so I brought the two of you, I brought two of these and brought one for, ho for you. I'll show you how to make quick spaghetti. We're not supposed to cook in the barracks, Daddy. What if they catch us? Sometimes cheating is okay. What? When people treat you like kuso, that's the equivalent of a bad word in, in uh, Japanese, to break the law. What? What sort of moral lesson was this? Break the law? I wanted to ask him if he had been one of the protesters at Santa Anita who had been arrested and sent away, but he was already walking toward the mess hall. I followed, and we emerged toting a bag of vegetables. Anyway, he, um, we cooked that, and um, I say here, the memorable spaghetti dinner in camp was the first and last meal, that precious hot plate. A few days later, it disappeared, and my father disappeared outside, too. He was always disappearing. And I assumed that the hot plate went because um, he also gambled and sometimes lost, and things seemed to disappear from my house, and then that was one. I remember a painting, a replica of of the sunflowers by Van Gogh that I coveted. I, I just loved it, and he promised it to me, and um, that too just went away somewhere. I don't know where it went to. Okay, in camp, there was a cemetery, and there was also, um, what do, you, what do you call it, um, not a memorial, uh, a stone there that said evacuees unknown. And this always, always just bothered me because how could there be an unknown evacuee? Because um, we all had numbers, we all had a block chairman, and at first the block chairman would knock on our door every night, making sure we were there. And um, about a year, this went on for about a year, and then that relaxed a lot. But I could not understand this. And so one, one day I asked John Hopper, and John Hopper is now the uh, principal of Granada High School, and Granada is the town a mile away from Amachi, which is the closest small town to the camp. And John Hopper moved to Granada deliberately after he graduated from college, so he must have been 22, 20, 21, something like that. And he has spent his entire life devoted to making sure that Amachi was on the map, that it wasn't forgotten, and recently, Amachi has become a historical monument, historical place, what, what do you call it? Um, anyway, it, it's uh, nationally preserved now, and so 
people can't go there and steal old things. What, what's left there is just really foundations. And um, I've been there half a dozen, eight times, and stood where my barrack used to be. Michael, my son, went with me a couple of times. This next, oh, I, let me explain this. this. This is my tribute to a man who might be buried, unknown, in that cemetery. And I gave him a choice of places to live. To your left is Mount Fuji, and he might live there. There's also a church a temple, uh, and there's a big farmhouse, and there's a, there's a lake. Anyway, I get, I'm giving him a choice, and I also made him a samurai because he's the grand warrior in Japanese. This is my tribute to a woman. She's apparently dead, but uh, her baby is alive, and at the bottom, is a little girl praying for both of them. And this girl stood in my dining room without a background for years because I didn't know what to do with, with this. I didn't know, I don't know what she would like. And so finally I put the atom bomb in back of her is symbolic of if the war had never happened, if Hiroshima, you all know where Hiroshima is, Nagasaki is where the United States um, dropped the atom bomb and pretty much obliterate, obliterated the town. My two cousins who lived on the outskirts of Hiroshima died later of radiation poisoning. But this, this just is like, she might be the lady, she might be the girl underneath the evacuee's unknown tombstone, or she might even be a person from Japan. I don't know. And, but like, if, if the war, if the atom bomb had never happened, she would probably be alive. I'd like to read you one more. Um, story about my uncle, Zen Tatsu. I met him in 1980. I worried about the way to greet him. One depth's about, one depth of, one's depth about depends on social status. The lower the status, the, the lower the bow, the lower the status, showing deference to the more exalted person. Uh, should I bow to my waist, bow at all? perhaps shake hands, Western style? My mother had no advice. Do what you want. He, know, he knows you don't know proper Japanese manners, so I appear like a bumbling American. The local train jerked and rattled and stopped at every hamlet and, and town as it chugged along the narrow tracks, sometimes hugging the hillside only an arm's length away. What shall I call him? Uncle? Oji-san? anything. He won't care. We'll visit my mother's grave at Konu Temple, she said. We need to do this soon because the government is building a dam and the temple and their graves will be all underwater in a few years. And I visited Kajita both times. I mean, I, I visited pre-flood and after flood. And yes, indeed, the town was built kind of in a shallow bowl. And so part of the town was on either side of the hillside. And when they put the dam in, they, they just covered up half the town. And I asked my uncle, why didn't you protest? Why didn't you sign, get a petition going? And he said, oh, it's no use. When the government wants to do something, it just does that. Thirty minutes later, we chugged into Konu Station, the one before Kajita, and that's where we were going. Oh, we're visiting the graves before seeing Uncle? No, we'll come back. 
There's no station at Kajita because it's too small. We'll have to walk from here or take a taxi. What? Walk with our luggage? No way. But it was the way. We stepped off the, stepped off the train and looked about. No taxi in sight. The station master informed us that we could telephone the sometimes on, sometimes off taxi man, and he might or might not be available. We phoned. Here he was. My heart pounded wildly as we approached the temple. Ah, here it is, Kajita, Kajita Osho-san's temple, the taxi driver said, and he bowed very low. When we tapped on the shoji frame, it slid open immediately, and there stood Uncle Iwatake in his crisp yukata, his rounded cheeks puffed into a broad smile. Tadaima, my mother returned. Oh, Onesan, you've come home. And she is the one who raised him like a mother when their mother died when she was 12 years old. Taidaima, my mother, returned his bow. And then I witnessed a sudden transformation in my mother. She was no longer the old lady unable to carry her suitcase up the main station stairs, who needed help op operating the ticket dispensers, who couldn't find her special lavender dress she had packed for this occasion. She immediately became elder sister. That was her identity. Then I too bowed. I bowed and matched his bow. No deeper, no higher. It felt right. And then I understood what my mother had said so many years before camp, that yes, I was American, but I was also Japanese, and I too had come home at last. But whatever your, your identity, what will matter most in your life is to be true to yourself and to be kind to others. Thank you. Okay, I will, I will be glad to answer questions. We have a, a few minutes. So I'd like to have some questions from the audience. Everybody's too shy? Yes. Um. I just want to know if you know how many people died in the concentration camps in America. I don't. You don't? Okay. There, there were a few instances of... of uh, guards shooting at people. And the one in Topaz, you know, is the famous one. He was, he was chasing his dog, and dogs were Ill, illegal in camp, and the guard shot him. And so there's a memorial for him. Actually, they built a memorial for him, which was buried, and then Recently, in the last five years, they undid, they, they took the dirt off and they reconstituted the memorial and they, they hold a service for him. But no, I, I don't know. I, but I, I would assume it's just a normal amount of people because I don't think they were illegally <laughs> disappeared. Yes. How long were you in the camp, and were you in more than one camp? Well, I was in Santa Anita for three, for a half year, and then we were sent to Amachi, which is in Colorado, for uh, well three and a half. So it was really a total of four years. And I was nine, and then I came to uh, Jordan Junior High School in Salt Lake City when I was thirteen. So I'm kind of. I don't know that we lost four years because they they did set up schools like you know that the, the example that I gave. But my piano lessons certainly kind of suffered. I, <laughs> I would talk talk a lot about. I I've, I've been listening recently to um, a pianist named Yun Chan Lim. Have any of you, any of you heard Lin, Yun Chan Lim? 
He's from South Korea, and he won the... This is very, way off the topic. <laughs> um, he, he won the um, Van Clyburn last year. He was the gold medalist. And I have never heard anyone play the piano the way that this, this young man. He was 18 at the time. He's 19 now. But I cannot stop listening to him. OK. Anyway, uh, that's I, the end of that. Sorry, I have a question about yes. these paintings that you've showed us. Are they, were they people that you think you saw at the concentration camps, or, or are they people that you dreamt okay, I about? I can't understand what you're saying. Sorry. Um, these paintings that you have, the, the people that you painted, were they people that you think you saw at the camps or, or you dreamt about them? No. Um, all, yeah, they, they have people in them, but no, they're, they're just from my head. Okay. No, they're, not pe they're not people that I know. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank Lily once again for coming to be with us. If you would like to come and purchase one of her books or ask Lily questions, uh, please come forward. Otherwise, we will see you next week.